Yeah. Hi, Mum. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Ben. <laughs> Your brother's in the other room. <laughs> oh, yeah, you guys might be here later. <laughs> I feel like I should have brought some like lounge music for the, <laughs> the waiting period. Thank you. <laughs> That's my lockdown endeavor. guitar <laughs> beautiful that was nice Good to see you. professor jacob beeman who taught me oh i taught you bits you did all the work <laughs> yeah i feel like beeman it's your turn now maybe <laughs> yeah oh god freestyle loop oh. little time <laughs> oh jesus i actually have all my gear in the other room what a terrible shame <laughs> are you on a laptop <laughs> i am i am on a laptop that oh gosh i have a guitar here hang on but it's not plugged in hence the gear excuse that's that's still true keeping it acoustic hashtag acoustic <laughs> headphones falling out it's a nightmare <laughs> Doing a webinar on the mushroom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Love it. Okay, we'll give it another two minutes just to be just stick to what I said. I'm going to post, because um, for those of you who don't really know what this webinar series is, um, it's kind of a project by the Roots Project in um, collaboration with Kirksell Valley Farm, which is part of Kirksell Valley Development Trust. Um, and we're fundraising for Abigail House, which is like a migrants and refugees, specifically destitute right, migrants and refugees housing um, in Leeds. So there's a link in the chat now, if anyone would like to help out with that. Um, no pressure, obviously, but if you, if you do. <laughs> so where's the link again? Um, it's in the chat, which is on the side under everyone's names. It won't show up for anyone who joins after you post it. So you might want to repost it once in a while. Okay, cool. Yeah, I might post it at the end as well. Thanks, I didn't realize that actually. Okay, cool. Yeah, let's start, it's five past. Um, so yeah, I'm Saren, I'm with Kirksville Valley Farm and this is Hussein, I think you're inside. Hello. Um, Hello. Yeah, um, so Hussein is kind of gonna be our mushroom man for today. Um, <laughs> I wanted to start off by, I don't know if any of you know who Merlin Sheldrick is, but there's a really nice part in his book that I think could intro what you're going to tell us about quite nicely. Um, so it says, mushrooms provide a key to understanding the planet on which we live and the way we think, feel and behave, yet they live their lives largely hidden from view and more than 90% of their species remain undocumented. The more we learn about fungi, the less makes sense without them. So Hussein, can you maybe like tell us what are mushrooms first before we start? And like your what you do in relation to them maybe for people. Yeah, I kind of discovered mushroom a cultivation. Well, I come I've come across um adaptogens um a few years ago in the pursuit of holistic health and trying to figure out 
um, why, why, why conventional medicine doesn't, doesn't do what it's supposed to be doing. Um, so, um, I mean, one of, the, one of the biggest influences on me was a guy called Paul Stamets, you may or may not have heard, or hopefully if people haven't, they'll follow, who really embodies something that I've always kind of wanted to, wanted the world to kind of progress to, which is <clears throat> the spirituality of science and the science of spirituality. The understanding that <clears throat> uh, the holistic approach to the planet in, in terms of how how we look at our, ourselves as indivi indi individuals, um, the way mycelium works, it kind of uh, both metaphorically and literally kind of teaches you that the planet is one uh, on a bigger scale, the universe is one, but they're actually literally connected in scientific ways. Uh, and uh, mushrooms have networks on the ground um, called mycelium and they, they kind of spread out. They, 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 they kind of have a symbiosis with, with the uh, ecosystem that they're in, bringing nutrients to places that need it, uh, trading nutrients with plants, bringing uh, nutrients from the mother tree to, to, to like a seedling. Uh, they, they, they seem to have been around a lot longer than, than mammals and they, they, they seem to have brought um, a few billion years ago, if I'm, if I'm correct, they've brought, they helped bring kind of plant life from, from, the, from the oceans to the land. Um, we, have a, we have quite a bit of, most people don't realize that, um, that we're actually, as humans, all, man, all animals are closer related to mushrooms than, um, than plant life because they're breathing oxygen and they exhale carbon dioxide. So when I kind of like got used to, when I kind of got into kind of understanding natural kind of more herbal uh, solutions to like human issues, uh, adaptogens, became a big thing natural ones as well not what an adaptogen is for people who don't necessarily know <clears throat> yeah well there's different ways to explain it the way i explain it is it's, it's kind of like yeah it's a natural holistic product that you, that, that um has a, often has a lot of benefits to for your body but it also, also tells your body to kind of improve itself instead of giving it what it wants um it's like a, almost like a key a program that it unlocks um uh, a process in your body where uh, things improve. Typically, adaptogens are, are like things that tell your body to adapt to stress. So uh, often it's kind of adapting to physical or emotional stressful environments or improving your ability in those in those ways. Uh, a couple of them, as we've mentioned in podcasts before, like ashwagandha, for example, is a nootropic, which means it's, it helps cognitive function. It has a um, it has like benefits for, for for thinking and cognition, and has some prospects in in that regard with Alzheimer's, and dementia, but also has other things like it upregulates um, hormones like testosterone naturally, downregulates cortisol, the stress hormone, so it adapts you to stress as well. These things usually have multiple properties. If you follow the trail of like um, holistic uh, natural adaptogens, you'll you'll inevitably get to mushrooms and fungi. So, what are um, some of your um, what are the some of the first adaptogenic mushrooms you kind of got into, and what do they do? Yeah, so I mean, like lion's mane is one of them. Like obviously, you're all familiar with it as well. It, it seems to have the properties that ashwagandha have for the brain, but a lot more pronounced, uh, like re renowned. I've got some notes here actually. So there's a lot of like adaptogenic mushrooms. There's about seven or eight that I'm quite into and like most of which I want to try and like there's a most of which I'm growing but there's a couple of them that you need a little bit more time to do so but lion's mane is a good one you can grow at home um, so it has a lot of benefits it's effective for like things like ulcers and tumors it's, an, it's a pretty good anti-inflammatory as well um, and there's a study from 1987 showing that it's effective for throat cancer uh, and, and gastric cancers um, and a few other benefits is it's, it seems to be one of two styles of mushrooms that um, causes neurogenesis, which is it helps the neurons regrow and repair, which really you can't really find in the synthetic world. It's actually quite rare anyway. So that's a really good adaptogenic property of lion's mane is the neurogenesis. 
specifically the the outer the outer part of a neuron it kind of helps that part grow re regenerate which could be damaged by you name it like ptsd depression uh stress uh, all sorts of issues so again it, it, it highlights a perspective of a, a human issue or human made issue uh kind of re resolved or addressed with a fungus and the, as we know fungus fungi kind of adapt to the environment and try and help the ecology balance out so on a psychological and, and, a, uh, and a kind of like physio physiological scale they have a lot of benefits for humans to improve us because we're basically the planet conscious um just like um you know just like the fungi we're not really separate from them but there's illusion that we that we are. Um, there's a few other benefits uh, to like all of these mushrooms that we'll mention today. They all have a, a lot of things in common. There's a common theme between them, whereas they they have a massive boost for immune system. They they seem to be very effective against a few cancers, uh, and they all seem to have an anti-inflammatory effect on your body as well. So, uh, hi, sir. Um, that's uh, um, a, a lot of uh, a lot of medicines that help your immune system. Caution needs to be taken care of with them because um, they, they can cause an inflammation of your immune system. Most of these mushrooms don't seem to do that. They have what, like the experts call, immuno Im immunoregulatory properties. So they kind of regulate. In other words, they they boost it, but they cause an anti-inflammatory effect on it as well. So people with autoimmune disease. To look into a few of these. Are there any, like, I guess, other than like neuro performance, are there any that really benefit with like physical performance as well that you'd recommend for people? Yeah, to be honest, it, so, yeah, quite a few of them will have positive, effect, positive effects on your body that have like physical benefits. What you mean in terms of like sports, exercise, endurance? Cordyceps. Yeah, like that, yeah. So cordyceps are a type of mushroom that you might have heard of. In the wild, they grow on um, uh, insects. Um, and they're a little bit more difficult to cultivate at home because of that. But um, you, there's a couple of strains. One of them is like a, a famous Tibetan strain that's like uh, studies show a hell of a lot of benefits uh, but in taking them. The list is massive, but Again, like with all the other adaptogenic mushrooms, they have a benefit for immune system. Um, some studies show anti-cancer properties uh, and anti-inflammatory properties. But with cordyceps, the speciality, <clears throat> for example, is because they all seem to have a speciality on top, uh, is athletic performance. Uh, I don't know if I've, I've got any notes on cordyceps. Here. But um, they kind of they oxygenate your blood. I think it's something to do with how they affect your blood, and and they have um, a life prolonging uh, kind of effect as well. Uh, these are studies that are kind of still going through. Uh, they're not famous because there's no profit kind of in in big pharma kind of studies for them. But cordyceps is something I'd recommend to someone uh, who would benefit from, like if they're suffering from anything or a disease or an issue that kind of slows you down or you require extra athletic performance or just generally we need to start a culture where because I, I used to be in the gym industry uh the fitness industry and um you know you you observe a lot of uh, artificial kind of profit-based kind of solutions there people are addicted to getting bigger and more muscular and um, they reach a certain age it's kind of like a given in the in the personal training scene where they reach a certain age they all start taking testosterone uh, whether on their own or they go to the doctors and they tell them to kind of top them up uh, whereas if you have a little bit of knowledge you can have your performance kind of naturally uh, improved because the adaptogens do that they tell your body to do what it they don't give it what it needs um so so um so cordyceps have that benefit. They they seem to create a lot of uh, circulation, and they 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 improve athletic performance to the point where uh, I, this would have to be quoted properly. But I think there was an athletic, a bunch of athletic teams that have been like accused of doping just because they take cordyceps, and they they seem to have like there's some anecdotal um, stories of athletics kind of being affected quite positively with these things to the point where people think they're doping. 
So cordyceps would be a really good one. Uh, anyone, yeah, yeah, like kind of hyperthyroidism, that kind of stuff w w would help a lot as well. Um, before we move on to like, look at the process in which you like, cause I'll show the video, I think after um, this, um, how did you move from like the decision to like yeah. take supplements and eat mushrooms to start growing mushrooms yourself? Um, it, it, you get to a point, well, you get to, well, I think there was a, like a, a lot of spare time during lockdown. I, I, like my, I'm a, I, I personal, I'm not a per, well, I'm a personal trainer, but like uh, I'm self-employed effectively with more, more focused on sports massage therapy, but that's not really happening. So it's kind of a, a half a fellow situation. Um, so you have a lot of time to kind of like learn things and do things during lockdown. I, it, it, it felt like it was meant to be, you know, I was just following that trend anyway of, of, for a few years of holistic natural medicines. Um, and, and that you get to a point where you kind of do your own research and things like, and, and, and you realize that what we're taught is a little bit different to what, um, what, what's the reality, what can help us. What we're taught is usually based on profit. It's based on kind of funneling you into a system where, um, you know, you, you know, if you, if you want, if you feel like you want to help people improve their lives or improve medicine, improve their physical health or mental health, you'd have to like be channeled into uh, some degree that kind of ignores a lot of things. And it, the university that gives, you know, the university system is usually influenced by a capitalist system that wants you to just kind of go into an industry, make profit, make money. Uh, so like, I don't know, like decades of of watching medicine fail and then realizing more and more, I'd realized this many, many years ago through, uh, you know, the negative effects of pharmaceuticals on myself, my family members, you know, people I care about. It kind of woke me up early to the anti-pharma stuff that everyone's already, everyone's already, everyone's now picked up on, uh, but still has very little power uh, against. But that's the kind of drive. The drive comes from understanding that pharmaceuticals are not here to help us. They're here to make profit. Uh, and in fact, they actually cause the opposite effect. So you want to pursue a natural alternative. And when you, when you live in a world where everyone's taking testosterone when they turn 30, 35, and you, and you pop an ashwagandha and a cordyceps, <laughs> you know, and you know you've done the research and you you see the people behind it. You see like Paul Stamets or Merlin Sheldrake, uh, these absolute legends who want to make the world the healthier highest place so we can um, make the planet kind of a better place, uh, less suffering. So, you know, people would, the planet would survive a lot better. That's the kind of drive that makes you kind of want to do good doing your, your own research. And I'm not talking about some kind of nonsensical kind of paranoid conspiracy talk. I'm talking about just the basics of what science there is out there and um, why it's not prominent, why it's not on the news, why why Pfizer, a company with an evil, 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 evil track record. And this isn't some conspiracy theory where they've caused deaths in children in places in Africa and they just kind of shell out millions of millions of dollars in money to just make up for it. A company like that is trusted and accepted um, as, as a solution to COVID, which we know it's making an endless profit for the rich billionaires who really aren't here for our benefit in the first place. When that when that's accepted, and then it, I don't think it's going to get much results, you know. It's, and and when um, when every other person doesn't really know what medicinal mushrooms are, uh, that's what I kind of want to tilt the balance of. Because once you get your knowledge and you thought you kind of like you get into mycology, understand these breakthrough mycologists and what they're doing, do you realize that one or two of these mushrooms, um, the way they work with your immune system, uh, is enough to COVID proof you, <laughs> and and like with it balanced with, with a healthy lifestyle, and making sure you're taking the right kind of food, so you're getting your zinc, you're getting your vitamins. There's nothing that comes close to uh, enabling your body and your immune system to do what it's naturally meant to do with the help of your body and your immune system extended because that's the earth. That is your immune system. That is your body. Um, so, so we live in a world where people are conditioned to trust kind of medicines that are no good for, for anyone apart from the people making profit out of it. And often they, they'll cause adverse effects. Um, um, 
we need to we need to we need to change that because those drugs are not good for your physical health for your mental health for your for your um, anything in your well-being but what i found is a lot of these natural adaptogens fungal based or not counter the negative effects of pharmaceuticals um cool let's go through to the process i think would you rather like when we do it go through the pictures and kind of explain what's happening in the pictures first or go to the video and then talk about that at the end uh yeah we can go for the pictures a little bit first and then the video okay cool i'm gonna if, if that, the screen with everyone and yeah um cool so yeah what is happening if it works in this picture give it a second my laptop's quite it's okay okay cool what's that so that's um that's um that's a baby lion's mane mushroom growing out um i didn't get the picture quite sharp but um lion's mane has like a it, as the name suggests it's kind of like a beard but it's it, or, or some people say like a brain or like a fluffy pom-pom i mean most would agree it's a pom-pom mushroom the good thing about lion's mane is it's a it's a gourmet mushroom as well as a medicine like it really tastes nice you fry it up with some garlic sesame seeds uh, the idea is to try and get enough to kind of be in the mushroom really rather than kind of buying or making the extract with lion's mane uh, so this is the what what the process is with most medicinal mushrooms is we'll go through it a little bit more later as well is you kind of you need them to grow it's kind of a bit of microbiology to begin with so you want to kind of make sure that if you're using spores that they germinate um, but they need to be all in a completely sterile environment where no other bacteria germs or other fungi uh, are there because they'll compete with them and um, in a lot of cases if it's a predatory kind of bacteria or fungi they'll um they'll take over so there's a lot of sterilization but with this lion's mane i kind of grew it out on grain so what i used is um liquid culture so i ordered um liquid culture from gourmetmushrooms.co.uk and they're based in leeds and they're the really good mushroom supply company the, the person who kind of runs it is um is a big fan of paul stamets i've got his book here this is this is basically the main thing that i learned from and inspiration and um, apparently this lion's mane that I'm growing is, is a Paul Stamet strain. So he kept it, he, he's met Stamets and um, he's kept it for a while. So what you do is you kind of, you need to get um, like liquid culture or, or spores that have germinated into some grains that have been prepared. And typically the, the process is um, to, you kind of hydrate the grains. So you soak them for 24 hours and then you kind of simmer or boil them for a little bit. So they absorb moisture and then you drip, you kind of like make sure they're dry on the outside. So you kind of dry them out a bit. Close to when you're ready to eat them, basically, if you were to eat them. And then it's a kind of a process of kind of putting them up in jars and uh, and and um, carefully prepared jars. And then it's a case of sterilizing them. So what most people do is use a, a, a pressure cooker or an autoclave. Yeah, between an hour and two of uh, at 15 psi is what kills all the spores and those spores or anything competing in the grains and then after that it's a case of finding a, a sterile environment or a, like a still air environment to kind of put your liquid culture which is the, the mycelium in a liquid form uh, or your spores that have germinated which will become a culture into the grains and then what happens is they incubate for a while and with lion's mane, for example, they'd have to incubate for a few weeks to maybe even a couple of months if it's a big bag. And then often with um, a lot of gourmet medicinal mushrooms, the incubation temperature is a bit higher than the fruiting temperature. So when you're ready to fruit, you kind of lower the temperature environment, the environment that they're in the temperature. And then another thing that mushrooms really, really like is uh, humidity. So I use a fogger here, but it can, it can be a kind of an environment where you've created humidity through moisture around it. I'm just, I've got a little bit of a lion's mane culture to show actually. This is something I've used already. So I don't mind opening up and kind of exposing it to air because that would normally contaminate it. So I've, uh, this is, um, 
this, I don't know if you can see the mycelium of linesman is is a bit rat, well, like wispy and like it doesn't look that strong, a bit sporadic. Some mycologists might see this and think, oh, is that contamination? But it's just the way linesman grows. It's just sporadic and not that thick and it's dotty. But normally what you do is if you, this is what I use instead of a Petri dish. It's kind of pre you, you can sterilize these cups. Um, so you can put a little bit of this once it's grown out into the grains to inoculate it, or you can kind of create liquid culture, use liquid culture and put that in to incubate it. So that's, yeah, that's lion's mane and it's gorgeous. It tastes beautiful. Okay, next image. Um, what are these? So these are um, bags, sawdust bags. I, I was in the process of filling them up. So um, you can also grow a lot of these medicinal mushrooms on sawdust, some supplemented sawdust. So, so in fact, that's the main method. Grains are usually a way to kind of um, get the mycelium in, so, in something high nutrient so it's strong. And you can put the grains to sawdust as well to kind of spread the mycelium from the grains to the sawdust. Um, normally you hydrate it and you have what you do it to what we refer to as field capacity. Um, what I use is kind of, I get a formula from the supplier. So basically with, with this kind of beechwood sawdust, to every one kilo of beechwood sawdust, you put 1.3 liters of water and that should hydrate sufficiently. Um, and that's enough moisture for the mushrooms to kind of, the mycelium to grow out on and the mushrooms to grow. I'm putting it in a spawn bag or, or a grow bag and these are um, auto, autoclavable. So you can kind of have them at 15, 16 PSI, uh, which is about 121 degrees centigrade. And um, they'll sterilize what's inside them. So similar to what we said with the grain jars, you put these in a pressure cooker when, when they're prepared, sterilize them. And once they're out, they're ready to inoculate and um, you can put the liquid culture in there. You can put a piece of like um, the mycelium in there um, from an agar or petri dish, as we call it, or liquid culture. Or some people do spore syringes as well. Um, that's also possible. It's just kind of creates a variation in potential genetics. Um, and what is that? So, um, yeah, I'm just checking. Are we addressing questions later? But um, yeah, if people want to, if you've got any questions, note them down and we'll have like uh, 15 minutes at the end. Be sweet. Yeah, I will talk about outdoors as well. Um, I'm not specialized in it, but it's it's a really good way to do it. Um, this is so this is liquid culture I was talking about. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, that's inoki liquid culture in a jar. Um, it's a medium where the mycelium can grow in water. Um, so you do the same kind of process. Uh, if you want to create liquid culture, for example, from spores. So you could get spores of a mushroom from a vendor. Uh, they usually come in a syringe and you inject it into the, the medium. And the medium is usually a kind of a small percentage of carbohydrate kind of, uh, people use honey, 4% um, by weight. I've used light malt extract here, which is um, another method of kind of having a nutrient broth. I put one gram to 600 mils, and then you put it in the pressure cooker. Because it's liquid, it only needs to sterilize for like 20 minutes. Once it's sterile, then you can kind of inject it. I'll put a piece of like um, this mycelium in there as well. Um, again, it has to be in a sterile environment, usually like a something like a still air box that we can go into later in, in this or another episode, um, where you can open the top and be confident that nothing else falls in. And then once you, you kind of like spin it out, you spin it out every day for a week or two. And then as you can see the bits of mycelium grow and then, bit, then the bits in between uh, are just like the water medium. I think there's another one here as well you can show. I think um, I might have uh, maitake. I might have given you a hen of the woods. Oh, that's the shiitake block. Okay, is that one? Uh, yeah. Okay, so the other one was maitake, hen of the woods. This is inoki. It's actually looking a bit healthier than the, than the other one, but uh, this is before I've broken it up. So when you spin it around, it breaks up, but it's kind of like a jelly, like a, a jellyfish kind of cloud. Of, it's really, really, I love it. It's beautiful. That's healthy looking mycelium from Inoki. Basically, I bought the Inoki syringe liquid culture. So it was already in a liquid culture form, already kind of um, ready to spread. 
and then I expanded it to more liquid culture. And that's one of the benefits of liquid culture is you can just keep expanding it for a little while and then have more of it. Okay, we'll go back to this picture as well. So this is a very interesting thing. This is, um, so those sawdust blocks that we showed earlier, this is, um, this is um, a shiitake uh, fruiting block. That's already, it's a shiitake block. So it's a block of, uh, of a mushroom called shiitake. Um, kind of go into the benefits of shiitake a little bit as well. It's because it is one of the top kind of both tasty gourmet and medicinal mushrooms. Um, so it's like, a, it, it's a very potent anti-cancer uh, mushroom as well. Um, um, let me just find it again. There we go. Um, so we we're gonna kind of, I'll go into polysaccharides as well. So one of the benefits of like the way mushrooms work and their adaptogenic properties is in some of the compounds that's in them called polysaccharides. Um, and then there's a type of that called beta glucans. And these are basically very, very complex carbohydrates that kind of work with and bind to proteins. And the complexity is to the form, to the point of it's become like, it's like a key that unlocks something in your body and creates the adaptogenic effect. Um, so a, a few studies that I've, I'm looking at here, um, the, you know, the studies in Japan that show it has anti-cancer properties. Um, there's a study from 1978 uh, from um, the scientist called Chihara, um, where it, it almost completely re caused regression of many solid tumors that they've looked at. There's a polysaturate in it called KS2, for example. It's a powerful anti-cancer gen, anti-tumor. It works again. It's an adaptogenic compound that binds to proteins and then just tells your immune system, your body, how to deal with it better. And another notable um, benefit of, of 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 shiitake, for example, to to attest to its um, uh, immune system boosting properties. Um, it, there's a study from 1993 that shows it, it, it can reverse the effects of herpes. Um, it slows HIV. And there's other polysaccharides that kind of have immune system boosting properties in them as well. And there's another study, um, Saren, that you might like, uh, that says, yeah, fermented shiitake is a lot more effective. Um, there's a bunch of studies from the 70s and 80s, so I've just not, I've not written them. But yeah, they say fermented is even better. So this is a shiitake block, and it's like, it's unique in the sense that, it, well, even compared to other medicinal mushrooms, it does take a, a bit longer to, um, it takes a bit longer to mature. And uh, most mycelium has white or whitish color. And so does shiitake, but after a while it goes brown. And that's kind of when you know it's ready to fruit. So this is a shiitake fruiting broth that we've actually kind of uh, harvested, eaten, um, and it's been put out for its second flush. Because uh, shiitake only does a couple of flushes, it just takes ages. It's worth it though. Um, yeah, I'll play the video now. Um, so if you just want to, I guess, talk over it because it's quite fast moving, but we can watch it twice through if people would like to just stay in the chat if you feel like you've missed something or want to go back to it or just saying if you want us to stop the video at any point, just let me know because it is in sections so we can go through it, stop it maybe. Um, yeah, sure, sure. So I'm just sending a link to someone who's uh, not checked it. But let's see. Okay, cool. I'll wait. Cool. Wait. I'm ready. Okay, sweet. So here we go. So this is the cloning from shop bought mushrooms. So this is a still air box, which is uh, what I was referring to earlier. It's like a you clean it up first. You completely wipe it down with alcohol, um, seventy to seventy percent plus isopropyl alcohol, um, or Dettol, or both. Um, it's an, and then you kind of you wait half an hour for everything to settle in there and anything that you need to work with you put in there um, so I'm like kind of preparing a scalpel or, or exacto knife um, in there uh, and cloning is a really really good way to grow mushrooms it's, you don't necessarily need to buy culture from from anywhere you can clone from the wild or even supermarket um, as we're doing here. So this is shimeji mushroom, another medicinal mushroom that has a lot of a lot of benefits, similar to enoki, um, which I'm growing at home as well. Um, and the process is you basically find the healthiest, largest one who's also among some healthy friends as well. And that's like a healthy cluster and you find a nice one. 
uh, I've kind of been a bit extra carefully and like sprayed it down as well so it's clean on the outside. A lot of people don't do that. And you kind of like, you spread it apart and you get a little bit of the flesh. And, and usually that's all you need. You put the flesh to like a, a, peachy, a petri dish that you've got the media on already. It's similar to a liquid culture, the media. It's like a gelatinous version of liquid culture. Um, and you watch it grow out. And then as it grows out over the next few, a couple of days or weeks, it takes a couple of weeks for it to start growing properly. Then you can observe it, see if it's healthy. If there's a healthier strand that's kind of coming out from the where you've planted it. You can take that, put it in another petri dish, watch that grow out. You can kind of keep doing that until you've got like a healthy culture. Also, that's how you eliminate kind of uh, contaminants, especially if you clone from the wild. Um, you're going to have other bacteria, fungi, contaminants competing, uh, very, very likely to be with the mushroom. Same from supermarket as well. You can't guarantee it being sterile. So, um, here we can see I'm opening up the flesh of the mushroom. So I can get into the middle because ideally in the middle, it's less likely to have contaminants. So even if it does have contaminants, it's gonna have less of a flame sterilizing the, the kind of head of my needle here. So I can start working. This is all happening in a still air box. So that's why it's a bit blurry because it's kind of PVC. So yeah, you can kind of blurrily see, but I'm taking a little bit of the flesh from the inside of the mushroom, just to minimize the chance of contaminants being on it. Yeah, you see, I've got a little piece there, just put it into the middle. And then once you get used to this kind of stuff, I want to kind of have a situation where we're living in a world where everyone's doing this, like it's, like it's plant work. Like mycophobia is the reason that we're not all doing this. Otherwise, it won't even be a specialist kind of thing. Everyone can do it. Everyone should do it. So I've got a fogger here, um, which creates a moist environment for my for my mushrooms. That's the top of uh, like a bottle that I'm growing uh, enoki mushrooms on. Enokis have like a different way to fruit. They 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 cultivate fruit them. I engineer them to go become quite long and thin. In the wild, they're quite short and wide. So I was just using a method to make them go long and thin by reducing carbon dioxide, um, oxygen levels down. So this is a hen of the woods, maitake. Another beautiful, beautiful mushroom with loads of medicinal benefits, similar to shiitake. We've got so the studies from like 83, um, a Chinese study from a guy called Chang Yung, 70% reduction in tumor mass. Um, I'll go into I'll go into my attack a little bit as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So another thing with my attack is, again, we're talking about man-made problems, and I don't know too much detail about hormone affecting pharmaceuticals, but I have observed a lot of um, kind of common issues um, that happen in modern society with men and women, for example, like. And I'll go into what Inoki does um, in terms of benefits for certain kind of tumors or cancers, but Maitake, as well as having all the benefits that we've mentioned, um, it, it, it's a, it seems to be a very effective treatment for a treatment resistant malaria. So that's something to look into. Um, it seems to be a natural adaptogenic malaria medicine for a, a treatment resistant variant. And also there's a study show that shows, um, uh, this study is in the Paul Stamets book, 76% uh, 70, improvement in pregnancy, pregnancy rates in women who previously were non-ovulating due to polycystic ovarian syndrome. syndrome. So polycystic ovarian syndrome, 70%, 76% improvement in pregnancy rate in, in women who uh, were not ovulating before. Now you, you could say that's not, that's, what, how that happened in the first place, we don't know. I do kind of know that medicines and pharmaceuticals are a big part in why we have that issue. And I'll go, kind of go into Inoki as well and how that affects men. So yeah, we're going into cloning shiitake. So these are like free shiitake clone plates that I've done before. So when I grow out the shiitake, I actually 
took a piece of the flesh from from a, a nice healthy big mushroom that had nice mushrooms around it and I, I think i'm in the video i'm trying to show you what it looks like on the inside because it's quite beautiful but i've got a sample here again that I can kind of show and it's gorgeous it's absolutely good. I just it puts a smile on my face the the fractalness of it but i'll just show you now if you can see so that's the mycelium of shiitake that I've kind of transferred a few times to make it cleaner. Uh, and I used some of it and then I put it in the fridge before it's fully grown out. But it's gorgeous. It has similarities with so many things in nature, like the eye, spaceship top as well, or a mushroom top. So here we're showing another process where I'm taking a little piece out of one petri dish and putting it in another. And this is kind of part of the cleanup process where you're kind of getting the healthier parts and making that grow out. So once you finally get to your mushroom block that you're growing, you've got the healthiest mycelium you can find, the most contaminant free. And it kind of becomes similar to like a whiskey where people like sing single malt is better than multi-malt. Um, especially when you're kind of doing this stuff from spores the spores will have multiple genetics, so you want to isolate the healthiest genetics and kind of use that. So that's a T2 transfer. It means I've transferred it twice. Uh, well, from the original petri dish onto this number two. Sweet. Sorry, I'm muting myself. Um, there's a question in the chat. Maybe we could go... Yeah. That quickly, if you can see it, it's from Goldie. It says, I live outdoors most of the time. What advice do you have for growing mushrooms in unpredictable environments? Like it can get warm and cold quickly and sterilizing things can be difficult. So Goldie, are you, are you, are you still here? Can you kind of like reply to any questions I have? I think, I think they might be gone. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think they've left. All right, okay, so um, we, could, we could give him a message saying we're back. Like, yeah, I, could, I, I can text them the answer, I know who they are. All right, cool. So there'll be a transcript anyway. Uh, I live outdoors most of the time. What advice would you for growing mushrooms on unpredictable moments? Um, like, it gets warm or cold quickly, sterilizing can be difficult. You can kind of sterilize things without a pressure cooker. It's kind of a, but if you can, you can steam sterilize, but You'd have to do it for a good 20, 24 hours to really get it. Um, endospores are an issue where um, spores are actually really cheeky. <laughs> they, they can survive a lot. Um, and they, they hide in the middle of grains and they're like, uh, don't tell anyone and I'll come out later and boom, take over their grow. So it's a fun, like, you know, predatorial fungus or bacterial spores. They have this kind of protective mechanism that can, can they can deal with a lot more heat and pressure, and then when that heat and pressure is gone, then they start kind of evolving and the DNA changes and then they become the fungus. But you, if you don't mind, kind of putting something on the on your hob for twenty four hours, um, you can do it without a pressure cooker. Um, in terms of unpredictable environments, you would have to kind of incubate at warmer temperatures. That's just a given. Some mushrooms you can incubate as low as fifteen degrees. Uh, of these medicinal. Uh, I would recommend using strong, aggressive strains. Now, oyster mushrooms um, are a very tasty gourmet mushroom. Um, I, I plan to grow and they seem to be the fastest, most aggressive strains. Some of them uh, are really fine with cold environments. Um, you'd have to look at incubation as well because incubation is always warmer, but all these medicinal mushrooms will grow in the cold. All of them will fruit in the cold. It's just whether they'll incubate in these temperatures. Um, so you want to normalize the temperature, but uh, 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 um, I, I would also look at your local kind of environment specifically and then see, see um, what advice you can find online as well, because I'm, I'm kind of like, I'm talking from the perspective of someone who's kind of like learned this stuff, got into this stuff, but I'm definitely not a specialist um, or a mycologist, um, an amateur enthusiast, um, which we should all be because that's the whole point of the culture is to kind of normalize it where we have 
mushroom grow kits in our kitchens or even some people put them in the bathroom like once the mycelium has taken over the, the substrate and it's quite strong um, you don't really have to work, uh, worry about contaminations as, as, as much as you would so you can actually put it in a especially a clean bathroom will create a good uh, like steam level for, for your, uh, humidity um, but yeah I'll, I'll look at oyster mushrooms they do have some medicinal benefits the, the, some of some especially some, some oyster mushrooms have, have close to these kind of levels of benefits Um, yeah, I guess we'll open it up as well. If anyone else has any questions, if you want to either unmute yourself or type in the chat, it's cool. Robbie? Hiya. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was fast. Thank you. Loads of good information there. Um, yeah, I've been getting dead into medicinal mushrooms, mainly like foraged ones that I've kind of picked out and about. Oh, okay tails and birch polypores and stuff like that but um yeah growing medicinal mushrooms is something that i really want to get into um so kind of thinking like what it seems like a bit of a minefield of like so much stuff but what do you kind of need basically to just start a simple grow like maybe i really want to grow lion's man it's the one that i want to grow so um so what what i would recommend is if you kind of want to um get into it quickly there's a couple of methods really like if like, i started with kits so i actually got a lion's mane grow kit and then from that i cloned and then instead of getting the culture but you, if you want to kind of start from a quite a base level and then do them regularly <clears throat> i would recommend using liquid cultures from a good vendor um, mm. there's no guarantee that they're completely sterile but Pretty much, these people use uh, what's called a flow hood, which is this this thing that blows sterile air, with it, with, with where they can work on, and they cost hundreds of quid. So, like, I think the gourmet mushroom guy, for example, his liquid culture was absolutely fine. So, look, um, liquid culture is a lot better than a spore syringe because you've already got someone who's isolated the good genetics. Look, hopefully, yeah. taking away the, the contamination, and then. Um, so, so if you are going to buy something to start with, uh, use a liquid culture. Uh, and then in terms of equipment, I use jars. So like, if you watch a lot of like, I, I'm an audiovisual kinesthetic learner. I love books as well when, when they teach you and when there's a passion and enthusiasm, but I, I'm a big, like I've learned so much from like studio, from like University of YouTube. Yeah. So there's a lot of good enthusiastic mycologists in, in the UK and in America um, to learn from that I've kind of become obsessed with. But it's a bunch of, basically it's a jars. So you can kind of, you can you can do a process where you you do culture to to grain to substrate. We can go straight from culture to substrate. So all these gourmet medicinal ones, um, they all grow on wood chips or like kind of supplemented wood because they're used to growing in on near trees. The other category of medicinal mushrooms, um, which we're getting you know a, a revolution in. I don't want to go into too much, but I've heard you know uh, th there's another there was other ones that grow on different substrates. So like for example. The psilocybin based ones which have like there's a revolution in mental health happen, happening from as right now you know i think it's part of how we're going to make the world a better place they grow on a little bit of a different kind of uh, they don't they don't grow on um, witches uh, and they're definitely a powerful medicinal mushrooms but the the rest of them they all go on kind of wood chips supplemented sure. wood chips so um if you don't want to get one of those plastic grow bags, because that's the only drawback to large scale, large scale mushroom growing is, is the big plastic grow bags. But the good thing is, it's actually that that field that's finding a solution to plastic problems. I don't know if you've heard, but there's like, yeah, there, there's a lot of beautiful, intelligent people working on engineering, engineering some of the 50 species of mushroom or fungus that eats plastic. But yeah, there's, you can get plastic grow bags with like air, uh, with kind of like fil filtered air kind of patches that don't let bacteria in at the top. You can get back, cool. back of like 20 uh, kind of fairly large ones for about 15, 20 quid. Probably even, well, probably 30 you could get. Um, and the basics of it is I get wood chips or, or, or sawdust um, and I supplement between 10 and 50%, 10 and 15% with organic wheat bran. Um, that, used, that kind of gives it the equivalent of what a tree would have. Um, right. And then you kind of bring it to field capacity. Um, you put it in the pressure cooker for, if it's a big block, you need a good two hours of pressure cooking. And that's very, very difficult to get hold of in the UK. The, 
15 PSI pressure cookers. Because uh, in Europe and the UK, they have them all at 10 PSI, which you can experiment with, but and there's the idea that if you just do it two, three times as long, it would work, but uh, right. you can steam sterilize as well. So you can put the big blocks in a big kind of pan, just have it, you have to have it boiling, steaming for 24 hours. So you'd have to kind of figure out how to pour the bar, boil the kettle and put it in. Yeah. But, but if you see it as a process that you're passionate about, it's a, it's a wonderful thing. And it can eventually save up and get a pressure cooker. The most common one that everyone uses is like the Presto 23 quart. Like Americans love the term quart, which is kind of a liter. It's like a 21 and a half liter pressure cooker with a pressure gauge. In America, it's cheap. It's like a hundred dollars. But for us to buy it, it's, it's, a, it, 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 it's, a, it's about 130 plus import duties and whatnot on eBay. But if you can save up, it's worth it. Otherwise, if you can find a way to steam for 24 hours, then you can get your substrate, substrates uh, prepared. Otherwise, I think we can segue this culture with grow kit culture. So mm. it depends how deep you want to go. If you want to become someone who provides those grow kits as well, uh, or, or, or and the information, or, or just want to be a user. Either way, that's totally, I can imagine, welcome by the mushroom world. But grow kits as well. So they send you it. It's already mycelium, covered in mycelium. It's ready to kind of fruit. That's when they send you it. And they're usually not that expensive. Like the, the one kilo shiitake block was seven pounds. And I think they had like a two, 2.2 2 kilo, and it was only like 15 pounds. I've, I've posted the, okay. the website for the one you've used into the Sweet. Pack. Yeah, yeah, bless, bless. Another thing is, do what you're doing now. Ask, ask, ask. I nagged so many people with so many questions. I bought two shiitake blocks from this guy, and I've just like texted him all the time. What is this? What is that? What do I do? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> cool. No, that sounds good. I'll definitely do a bit more reading around. And um, what was that book you had also? Uh, oh, so yeah, this is definitely something I'd recommend. It's my friend lent me it, but I'd buy it a thousand times. Um, growing gourmet awesome. medicinal mushrooms with Paul Stamets. Oh, is it Paul Stamets one? Cool. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's, this is a good reference book. The only thing it doesn't have is Cordyceps, but um, right. it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Oops. So, so indoor, outdoor, medicinal, you know, yeah, all of them. Flush. Thank you. Thanks yeah. Uh, does anyone else have any questions? Or oh, I can kind of go into some more, more stuff. I did want to mention Inoki. Um, it it's, uh, makes you sound like a broken record, but they all kind of have this benefit again. So it's um, the polysaturide, the, one of the polysaturides in, in Inoki is called flamulin, and I did pronounce that right, I think. Um, it's a study from uh, a person called Ying uh, in, in, from China um, in 1987 that shows 80 to 100% effective, uh, effectiveness for sarcoma and carcinomas. Um, they have unusually low cancer rates in areas where this mushroom is consumed in Japan. And the studies are from like, nine, go back to 1968, 1990, that show, that show the anti-cancer properties. Which good, I mean, a lot of these studies are like initiated such a long time ago. You'd, you'd think it'd be common knowledge by now. So you kind of like start to think how the world works where information is only geared towards those who want to make profit. Um, Another uh, property of Inoki that I wanted to bring up is um, it shows the fantastic results for uh, a lot of these cancers, as mentioned, like but prostate cancer is one. So it's kind of like specialized in a in a hormonal cancer as well. So enlarged prostates, that kind of cancer, Inoki is good for that, which is really cool because you see these specialities that they do as well as the general kind of benefit that they have. Like, for example, the, the maitake and the um, polycystic syndrome. Did want to mention a couple more mushrooms whilst I'm here. So these are all what um, I'm growing or intend to grow. <clears throat> There's a couple of mushrooms that are like wood conch style. They're, they're, they're physically a little bit more dense. Um, these are medicinal, but you, you can, you, they're not really gourmet. So it's, you either do extracts or teas or tinctures. And then you, this is the most famous that you might have heard of, of all the medicinal mushrooms, it's reishi. Um, and again, it's, it's, the, it's the studies, loads of studies showing um, disease resistance, longevity. So again, people with like thyroid issues, for example, cancer fighting properties. Uh, it's been used as an anti-cancer uh, medicine in, in, in Asia for, for hundreds of years. Um, and it has very complex beta-glucans. Uh, some species have 40% kind of 
uh, beta glucans that's really really high medicinal content adaptogenic content um i've got a bunch of other things like the way it works like it stimulates t cell production it has uh, again the immune system boosting whilst having an anti-inflammatory effect uh, um, and it's good for blood health so there's a study from 1989 that says uh, it lowers, it, it regulates blood sugar levels and blood lipid levels. Uh, and there's another study from uh, China, a scientist is called Yun from 1995, uh, showing significant reduction in lung cancer cells. Uh, and it's it seems to show a toxicity to, to, to cancer cells. This study is from Japan, uh, from a, a person called Mizushina from 1998. Um, again, Reishi has shown, pro, um, has shown um, uh, uh, significant reduction in HIV production um, in the human cells, in the human body, and that's the study from 1994. And it also fights uh, the studies that show it fights DNA damage, which is kind of similar to like cancer. Um, Reishi is all over the world as well in different forms. Um, I've not seen too much of it. In like the local local areas like me and wood would ask but um what i have seen is turkey tail and turkey tail's everywhere uh, so if you do a bit of research there's different variations of them to hot countries warm countries you can find turkey tail where it's hot and humid you can find turkey tail in woodhouse ridge um before all the critters get them uh, um, they're quite pretty um uh, again it's uh, there's a studies from 1997 uh uh, Nakuzuto is a scientist, and uh, if I spell this correctly, it's Sugimeshi uh, studies from '97 and '94. I'm quoting them just to kind of like so people know what to reference if they want to think about it, or, or if it doesn't sound that generic because people say this about everything. But these are some serious studies. So, in the case of turkey tail, this is the info I've got from Paul Stamets' book um, combined um, with chemotherapy. This is what Paul Stamets said. Uh, uh, has a incre uh, in increases the survival rate uh, of, of many cancers it, with the help of the main polysaccharide that it has, it's known as PSK. Uh, it reduces cancer metastasis from a study uh, uh, for Kobayashi, which is the name of the scientist from 1995. Uh, and it's a powerful anti free radical. The polysaccharides in it. Some of them are called PSP, which in inhibits HIV production. So that studies from three, three different mushrooms uh, with, with HIV production. And there's other polysaccharides, PSK, RPSB. There's a bunch of them that have like the immunomodulatory properties, anti-inflammatory properties. The studies show that it's, uh, turkey tail has a fantastic effect for reducing uh, leukemia. Uh, and it has strong antimicrobial properties. So these are all really, really, really COVID periods, COVID time uh, kind of uh, um, mushrooms. The, the, there's an anecdotal video, kind of kind of story about turkey tail as well. Um, if people are like me, obsessed with Paul Stamets, you already you know it. But he this story, he'll mention it in his in his lectures as well, where his mom was in in her eight, late eighties or nineties, called him one day. If you, yeah, Catherine, do you, have you, do you know this one? Yeah, yeah. So she had incredibly enlarged kind of breasts, kind of doctor said, no time left. Um, it's over, like, she, she's like covered in cancer. Uh, and then she got lucky because in her case, like her doctor or a friend, I think someone might even be in their doctor said, hey, well, there's, I've seen this study that turkey tail can help give it a try and then, and then she goes well my son makes loads of turkey tail and I should ask him so when she called Paul and Paul said what's up and he said she said this is Paul gave her like I think six six or eight turkey tail uh, capsules a day I have two a day um, and um, and like yeah he famously kind of talk, in his talk brings his mom on show on the show 10 15 years later where she's well into her 90s and very alive and very healthy <laughs> uh, I'll go, I'll go for that one. It's all right. So, uh, sorry, my housemate's just cooking.
well so has anyone else got any questions um any advice any kind of anything you want to tell me anything i've missed is there any mycologists here <laughs> Sweet. I think covered quite a lot of things for people to think about, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, like, let's maybe wrap it up then. And thanks um, a lot for um, coming and teaching us all this. Um, if, is there any, like, are there any websites or resources you'd like to suggest before we go? I'll post the links to the Roots stuff as well in the chat quickly just so people know about the next next week's webinar and the crowd and stuff sweet sweet yeah yeah sweet so I um I just want to thank Saren because you're a legend and 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 you you see magic all around the world uh, and you bring it to light and you inspire people to do what they might be a little bit shy to do so yeah thank you so much because you bring so much light to the world uh eternally love you um yeah but um i was gonna say so what did you ask again <laughs> i got a bit <laughs> if you had any like links or things. oh yeah so i mean again i'm audiovisual but like it, for learning i i use youtube but you can kind of go on these people's websites so if you get into my calls you'll hear fresh cap mushrooms a lot um their fresh cap mushrooms are on they're on youtube and they're a really 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 good informative kind of gourmet medicinal kind of a mycologist kind of group and um, they have a lot of videos where they show you indoor cultivation outdoor cultivation all the stuff that i'm showing you about the benefits they go into a bit more detail um, um and yeah and in their videos they have this massive 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 reishi mushroom the size of a table and it's beautiful i just thought i'd let you know so that's fresh cap mushrooms um and then there's there's um Fresh from the farm fungi as well. Fresh from the farm fungi. Again, they're a, a specialist mycologist uh, kind of center place when they show you how they grow stuff. I'm following him now and he's kind of in the process of doing a, a lot of things, but he's currently growing cordyceps and experimenting with it because cordyceps are still in the experimental stage of how to grow in the best way possible. Um, what we grow at home is like cordyceps militaris which is uh, proven to be just as powerful as the, like the rare Tibetan version, which inspired people in the first place. And that's really hard to get or even grow because the Tibetan version will only grow on insects. Whereas those, if you ever see like an orange twiglity looking thing sticking out of the grass, I think it grows on fields uh, in the UK as well. It's, that's a cordyceps. So you could kind of pick that and try and clone it from the wild. So fresh from the farm fungi, uh, fresh cap mushrooms, uh, and there's a few there's a few mycology places um, um, on websites based in the UK as well. But I think off the top of my head, I forgot. Um, there's one that stands out as well. Bless. It's got the word mushroom in it. <laughs> so they usually have the word mushroom or fungi in it. Um, but I would definitely, definitely recommend Paul Stamets for the more kind of study. Uh, he's got a website, obviously, paulstamets.com. And for the more specialized people as well, he's got like links to the studies that he's done and, and is part of and any studies pertaining to um, um, any studies sort of pertaining to uh, uh, any kind of uh, kind of studies that kind of help like mushrooms help in the world, not just medicinal. Um, another shout out I'd, I'd do is to Natura Studios. So naturastudios.org, I think is their website. Um, they're on Instagram, Natura underscore studios. Uh, and they're legendary revolutionary kind of people as well. Um, I talked to the main guy from it and he is mainly a design student, but he got into mycology as well. And he, basically they're designing a, a vegan lever based on mycelium. So there's like a mycelium structure. I don't know if you've seen, but there's, there's people that are kind of getting into growing fungal based kind of like objects and things. But um, he's also kind of, supportive of that whole fungus eating plastic movement as well um if we can support that that would be really really good i think the fish in fact everyone would would uh would thank, would like that <laughs> okay thanks for saying um yes yeah cool. thank you so thank yeah you. we'll put these links down as well
Yeah, yeah, they're all in the chat. So if everyone wants to grab them like quickly now, um, I'll switch the meeting off. All right, cool. Uh, thank you very much. Hopefully we'll see each other again.